Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Optimizing Your MSP, Auditing Your Business for Better Performance. My name is Eris Demosthenus. I'm the Training Content Manager here at SolarWinds MSP, and I'll be your host for the webinar. Been in the industry for a really long time, but I'm not going to get down, go down that path. The point in today is really about talking uh, to you guys about things that we could be doing to help improve our business given that we have some time. I've been in the industry a long time. I've talked to a lot of customers, probably over 1,500 MSP business owners in my time uh, just on the consulting side, and always I, hear the, I heard the same thing, and that is, I wish I had more time to improve this part of my business or that part of my business. Well, we hear a lot of feedback lately that we've got a little bit of extra time. Things have slowed down just a little bit. Some are still busy. Some have a little extra time. So today's webinar is all about saying, hey, guys, now that you have time or when you have time, if it isn't now, here's some of the things you could be looking at doing. We're not really giving advice here. Uh, today, the presentation is more about uh, providing you with food for thought on the many areas you could be remembering, you know, you should remember to ask yourselves about and fix as you move forward. Okay. Now, before I introduce our expert panelists, of course, we need to go through the obligatory housekeeping slide. Yes, you're all on mute as usual, not because we don't want to hear from you, uh, just to make the audio experience a little bit better for everybody. Um, if you have any questions, we implore you to please use the question panel, not the chat window. Um, if you want that question answered after the fact, we will not be able to see it. If it's in the chat window, we'll, need, uh, we'll only be able to see questions in the question panel. So please put everything there. And if you're having any audio visual issues, please let us know. Even in the chat, that one's fine, I suppose, because uh, we don't need to know that later. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce our SolarWinds MSP head nerds. Today, we're joined by them to discuss the topic. Um, each of them are gonna discuss it from their area of expertise. These guys, are non-quota carrying, okay? Their job is simply to provide you guys with expert advice on their particular topic with the ultimate goal of helping you guys get to the next level, whatever that happens to look like for you, okay? I suggest highly that you attend any sessions that they create for you as your success is what they focus on. Eric Harless, for example, on the far right there, did a data protection bootcamp today. Hopefully you guys know where to go uh, to get those links. If you don't, uh, we're posting them in the chat window for you now so that you can go and sign up for their stuff in the future. Um, again, it is not salesy. They will not be trying to sell you anything. They're basically trying to get help you get the most out of uh, the products you've purchased and you know the theory around uh, what you should be doing with your business. But let me introduce the head nerds today. So we've got Gil Langston, uh, first and foremost on the left-hand side here. He's our head security nerd and brings with him years of experience in the security space, both from a sales and a product management background. Our head automation nerd, um, Mark andre Tanguay, has been pushing the automation boundary in our products and in the space and is responsible for many of the objects you'll be leveraging in our automation engine. Eric Anthony is an ex-MSP owner himself and uses that real-world experience to help guide us through operational questions as the head operations nerd. And last but definitely not least, the guy I mentioned first, there's a full circle for you. Eric Harless, our head backup nerd, who similarly to Gil has a ton of industry experience, both in sales and product management in the data protection and recovery space. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. So there are four areas of improvement we want to touch on today, but I'm not going to ruin the surprise. Instead, let me hand it off to our head operations nerd, Eric Anthony, uh, to get us started with our first topic, improving your processes. Take it away, Eric. All right, thank you, Eris. All right, so let's talk about improving our processes during this period of downtime. Uh, because any improvements that we make now in our business processes, in our technical processes, are gonna pay dividends down the road. Uh, when we get out of this, uh, this stage that we're in, we're gonna be able to use those efficiencies, use those processes to increase our capacity and therefore increase our profits with the same amount of resources that we're using now. And that moves us on to our first poll. Uh, do you have documented processes? So Eris, if you could go ahead and put that poll up, thank you very much. And what we wanna see is yes, all of our processes are documented. Yes, well, most of our processes are documented. Yes, well, some of our processes are documented or answer us and let us know, no, none of our processes are documented. We had a couple in the first session today. It's all right, it happens. 
Uh, sometimes people are so busy working in the business, they don't have time to work on the business, and that's kind of what we're focused on today. So it looks like voting is happening rapidly here, so we'll give it another couple of seconds, let everybody weigh in. All right, so thank you, Eris, for putting up the answers. So 0% say all of your processes are documented. This is fairly common uh, because, like I said, we're so busy doing so much work in the business that we rarely have time to keep up with getting everything documented. 13% uh, pretty healthy number saying yes most of our processes are documented 79% by and large the vast majority say yes some of our processes are documented but obviously there's some work that needs to be done there and then 8% were extremely honest and said no none of our processes are documented and so hopefully some of the stuff that we're going to share with you today is going to help you with that all right so moving on so let's look first at your support process. There's a couple of areas within the support process where we can really help, especially when it comes to your knock and help desk. So the first thing is your triage process. Do you have a defined workflow that you follow when a new ticket comes in to your help desk? Now, is it automated? Is it a person triaging tickets? Well, you know, AI is getting better. You know, we'll admit it's it's going through some things. And PSAs do have some workflow rules and things like that that you can engage to automatically sort some of the things and get them to the right location, especially if, you know, you have a certain ticket queue or a certain uh, technician that works with a certain client. So whenever a ticket comes in from that client, it can automatically be triaged and assigned to that client. Um, but a lot of the, the text that comes in in a ticket is just that. It's it's just free flowing text that somebody typed in. And without really good AI, there's no way to know exactly what that ticket's about. So it does help if you have enough people in your organization to have that designated person triaging tickets. And you want to make sure that you have a defined workflow around that process. The next one is dispatch. Uh, we all know that truck rolls are expensive, on site service is expensive for us to engage with. So what we wanna do is make sure that we have a process for evaluating a ticket to see if it should first be attempted remotely or do we need to go ahead and schedule that on-site visit? Because it's, it's important. We wanna reduce our expenses as much as possible. So the more that we can do remotely, we want to. So we wanna have a workflow and a process around our dispatch procedures as well. And then it comes to escalations. We've talked about escalations a little bit in the past, making sure that you have defined time periods that things will stay in tier one or tier two before they're escalated up. Um, but another important part, and we're gonna touch on this a little bit later today as well, is having a post-escalation process to push those types of tickets that were escalated from tier one and tier two you know, up to make sure that those can be pushed back down and handled by tier one or tier two in the future. Because one of the ways you gain a lot of efficiencies is to make sure that tickets don't have to sit in these tiers while they're waiting to be escalated and they can go ahead and be handled by those tier ones and tier twos. So make sure that you have some type of escalation process in place. And especially right now, when you have the extra time to go through some training, create that post escalation process so that you can record those tickets that were escalated and come back to them and say, okay, this is how you would train your tier one people to you know, handle these in the future. Now, some tools that you're gonna wanna use to be able to engage uh, this and, and kind of define your workflow processes, get some type of mind mapping or flow charting software. This can be extremely helpful when you're designing these things or just trying to figure out what components you want to move around and figure out what order they're gonna be in. It really does help. There's a lot of free solutions out there. So take your pick, whichever one works for you. And, uh, and use it to help you keep this all organized. So a couple other things, begin with the end in mind. What are you trying to improve? And really to, to have that focus, you kind of want to focus on one thing at a time. So are you focusing on increasing customer satisfaction? Are you focusing on reducing the time to resolution? Or are you focusing on decreasing the tech time spent per ticket so that you can increase those profits. Uh, different things, obviously, all of these are important. We don't want to ignore any of these, 
but focus on one at a time and you'll be much more effective at creating the right processes to fix those different things. And then of course, if you don't document them, write them down, get them into a document, get them into a flowchart, and then share them with your team, really doesn't matter if you did it or not, unless you're the only person on the team. And it's still valuable to do that because a repeatable process, even as, as a one-man shop, if you create those processes now, as soon as you are ready to hire that first technician, you will be ready to hand that stuff off to them and it'll be a much quicker, much cleaner training process when you bring them on board. Now, whenever you're implementing any kind of new processes, you wanna set some type of SMART goals for those processes. Now, SMART goals are translated very often to different things for different people. Uh, most commonly, it goes like this. They need to be specific. You need to be very specific as to what that end goal is. It needs to be measurable. It needs to have a goal where you can measure things as you're going and know when you've achieved them, which brings us to the next one, which is usually achievable or attainable. You can't have a goal that's just way out there that is never attainable. It has to be reachable. I usually call this one actionable because I actually, when I go through and create a SMART goal, I wanna create the actual action steps that it's going to take for me to get to that goal. And then relevant, it has to be relevant. All these goals have to be relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. And then of course, time bound. If you don't put a time limit on setting these goals, then you're, you know, human nature, you're gonna procrastinate. And then of course, the ultimate measurement of service is CSAT or net promoter score, depending on how you measure it. You wanna be measuring that so you know where you stand with your customers in terms of your service delivery. Now, when it comes to documentation and processes, there are lots of things you can look at. Some of the things you wanna look at are your standard operating procedures for things that may be outside of tech as well. Things like billing, things inside of tech like routine maintenance and repairs. Like we talked about before, if you have those written down in standard operating procedures, they're going to be much more easily repeatable by your other technicians. And even if, like I said, you're a one-man shop, as soon as you bring on that other technician, you'll have these already you know, prepared and ready to go for that person to follow. And then of course, don't forget your people and HR processes. People need to know where they stand, what the processes are within the business. As an employee, don't leave those things up for interpretation. Make sure they're documented so people know what to do. This is also a great opportunity to write or update KB articles, both internal as well as external. Uh, one of the things that we know from operating our own uh, help desk and support desk here at SolarWinds is that KB articles can quite often provide a level of self-support to customers that is very beneficial to both the customer because they get an answer faster and for the support team because they have more time to spend with other customers. Uh, we wanna verify and update any incomplete data that may be in your systems. Now this could be boring, quite often it is, because you're just verifying that customer and contact info are correct in your PSA. You're making sure that asset information is right for all of your clients across the board. And very importantly, you wanna make sure your credentials are stored safely as well as are correct so that when your technicians are going in and trying to do work, they have that information at their fingertips. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about how to motivate people to do some of that boring but very important work. But for now, speaking of credentials, let's hand it over to Gil Langston so he can talk about security. Perfect, thank you so much, Eric. So, uh, you know, he's been talking about a lot of the processes uh, that you wanna document uh, in playbooks and escalations and workflows. Well, one of the ones that may be a little bit different uh, in a lot of situations is an incident response playbook, right? Having a good workflow that if you have an issue that comes up that you believe may be a security incident, um, making sure that you have a way to promote that to the right severity, investigate that and hand that off because sometimes time can be of the essence when you're dealing with um, an incident response type of situation. Um, now you can see I've got an image here of the NIST incident response lifecycle. It's got four sections. Uh, SANS has another one uh, that is six sections, but they, they, they really cover the same points. Um, in fact, I, I've just put in the chat window a link to both the NIST 853 incident response as well as some incident forms you can use uh, from SANS.org uh, that can help you kind of build this cycle. But you know, one of the things that's most important is a security incident can be different than a regular ticket, 
right? Uh, generally, the tickets go into a queue, the next person grabs them, but um, you really want to take a look at, at the type of incidents that might be coming in, uh, be it a, a detection type of situation that requires more investigation, a confirmed uh, incident or issue that's been reported by somebody. Uh, you want to be able to triage that very quickly and make sure that you can promote that that incident to a security type. Now, in some of the uh, boot camps and webcasts that we've done, uh, I've talked about uh, maybe appointing somebody or assigning somebody who has a security interest to be that subject matter expert. Uh, this would be a great person to then uh, involve in this process and, and assign to uh, investigating the severity and kind of playing quarterback throughout an incident like this. Now, some of the things that you can look at promoting to a security incident is, you know, an alert from endpoint protection. Something was blocked. Now, yes, it was prevented, but you might want to investigate further on a deep scan on the system. Uh, having those items documented is, is very important to make sure uh, that you know how to react when something like this comes up instead of scrambling at the last minute. Um, but also looking for things that could be an indicator of a possible compromise in the environment. You know, antivirus services being stopped, one or two, that's okay. It's probably course of doing business, but you start to see multiples, that should be a concern with further investigation. Now, the same goes for things like uh, failed logins increasing. That could be a bad actor uh, trying to uh, elevate or to move laterally within the environment or to access resources, um, but also that would be evidenced by additional account lockouts uh, in a lot of situations too. So think about having all of those as incidents that you then investigate further. Um, but let's not forget about a, a user starting a ticket. They could just be complaining about a problem, but it could be the indicator of something else coming up. Um, you know, my system's acting funny. It's is something's something's wrong or hey I received this email is this real then suddenly you receive two or three of those next thing you know you could be under an active attack from a bad actor and you might want to actually inform people not to click on these links if they come out so um, or, or even the worst one oops I clicked on something uh, I think I've done something wrong uh, then making sure that the accounts are changed and you know if, especially if they submitted credentials to a phishing site for example having them change those credentials to minimize the impact of that event now, I took that and, and kind of broke it down into some of the things to consider. Uh, this is a starting point. Uh, you know, incident response playbooks can be very detailed, as you, you'll see if you look at the NIST uh, 853. But start with some of the basics and grow that over time, working with your subject matter expert. Uh, make sure you create those severity levels and base them on the business impact. Um, but also, uh, for example, your crown jewel systems, the servers, the application servers, the ones that are housing data, probably need a higher severity and a, a shorter SLA uh, to make sure that you're protecting that important important information. Document that whole incident flow, um, then make sure that you're identifying all the sources and who triages those, categorizes them, and then does that investigation to determine what the next steps are. Um, but also a couple of things to, to really think about is during that respond phase, do you need to communicate with a stakeholder in the organization or to people within the organization you're supporting that you're currently working on something and to expect either additional communications, something like that? And then finally, is 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 it important to externally communicate? Are there any vendors or partners that might need to know about this if it's gone to that level? Um, then you've moved on to the containment or the eradication, you know, ensuring you know what you need to do to neutralize that threat. Um, it could be that you uh, call some outside assistance. Um, it could be that you need to capture evidence, uh, and especially if you're in a regulated environment. Um, document all of those steps taken and then make that decision. Am I going to fix this issue or am I going to do a restore and try to recover uh, more quickly that way? So that's a decision point. But then finally, once you've done that, making sure that you close the loop on any of those open communications so people understand what's going on, storing all of that documentation or evidence uh, as needed later. But then finally, uh, the most important part of any process or a playbook is to evaluate your performance on that and then improve it over time. What could we have done better? What policies or settings do we need to implement to um, to kind of close that entire loop. Now, one of the things we talked about there was uh, the recovery side of things, right? Sometimes maybe restoring from backups and starting over is, is your best, uh, best bet um, to move forward. So I think that's a great time to hand it over to Eric Harless and he can talk a little bit about uh, backup and recovery um, in, in improving your processes. Eric? Thank you, Gil. Um, good segue there. I do appreciate that one. Um, so 
you know, the question really uh, uh, extends to, um, you know, is there really anything to document around backup? You know, um, can't we just back up everything? Can we just keep it forever? Um, well, that's when it gets complicated. You've got cost and space and change over time. You've got clutter and the overall effort and just make, making this uh, protect everything and store everything uh, super challenging. Uh, you're going to further compound it when you put legal and medical and financial and personal information in there. All those have different rules about what you can protect and what you can delete and when you can delete it or how long you can hold on to it if you're even allowed to hold on to it. Um, so as if it couldn't get worse, many of you are managing multiple backup and recovery solutions across multiple customers or maybe multiple solutions inside of the same customer. Um, so to that statement, I've got a quick poll that I'd like to throw up. Um, if you guys could uh, uh, do me the honor there in the background. Um, how many different vendors um, are you, or solutions are you utilizing for backup? How many are you managing? So, you know, only one, you know, hey, it's an ideal solution. You've got one solu one product out that you're gonna work with. Uh, maybe you've got just enough and that's two, that's three. Maybe it's just one also, but it's working for you just fine. We fully understand that there's different solutions for different, technolo different technologies, different solutions for different customers. Uh, but maybe you've got a few too many and it's a good time to consolidate or think about consolidating. Um, or maybe you're actually embarrassed to say you've got so many solutions, so many different configurations, you've never turned down a customer uh, when they've come to you with their own backup solution. Uh, so let us know what that looks like. Um, and sadly, um, a lot of organizations are treating backup like it is an afterthought. Um, you've got homegrown solutions, uh, they're out of control, maybe you've never set it up properly to begin with, you've just kind of grown over time. Um, so all of those are going to come into play here. Um, while we're being honest with ourselves though, um, if your patch systems or your AV systems, your ticketing systems were in the same state as your backups, um, you wouldn't let it fly. You know, you wouldn't do business in that type of structure. Um, backup is that last line of defense, but it's like I said, often an afterthought uh, when it comes to uh, proper deployment inside of an organization. So hopefully we can help you with that. Uh, so let's see, our results here, 31% uh, said only one, 34% uh, at uh, just enough, a few too many, 21%, uh, and a couple people actually embarrassed to say, thanks for being honest there, there's nothing wrong with that, it's a great time or opportunity to try to get that straight. Um, so um, how do we go about doing that? Well, we start with good documentation and processes around uh, the backup and recovery environment. So start by documenting your current environment and your current customer's configurations. Um, so I've kind of got a bit of a who, what, when type of checklist for you here. And this is really for your uh, reference as you build out or audit uh, your backup and recovery practice. So on the who side, you know, document, document and categorize and prioritize your clients based on who or what is most important to you and you're in business. Um, you might base it on the size of the business or the revenue potential for you or the type of employee or personnel that they are. Uh, ranking the CEO or the owner's laptop more important than say uh, rank and file staff inside of that organization. Uh, but regardless of what you do, keep in mind this ranking when you're prioritizing your deployments, responding to tickets, making changes to your processes or building out a service level agreement. Um, on the what side, it's about documenting um, what you're actually protecting so that uh, when you come back to it later for comparison, what your customer thinks you're protecting and what you're actually protecting are the same. Uh, maybe you only get the documents, maybe you only get certain directories or you're getting full systems. They need to know uh, what to expect. You need to know what you're planning on recovering. Um, maybe you're gonna exclude volumes or you're gonna get rid of the movies or the music or the temp files. Um, you know, they're a business, they're creating movies, they're creating um, those documents. Well, maybe you do wanna protect those. Um, ultimately, review with your customer and get the sign off um, so that you uh, have an established SLA that you all agree upon. When, it's often uh, as important as the what. Um, so what is the customer expecting in a recovery point objective, an RPO? Uh, that's the allowable data loss. So it's gonna determine whether you recover from last night's backup or last week's backup. Um, your service level agreement with a customer is gonna need to match that. Um, it means that you're gonna do a daily schedule, an hourly schedule, a weekly schedule. Sometimes it's gonna also depend on your recovery needs. You know, how quickly can you get the data back? Your service level objective. Uh, now I say objective here because it's not something that's gonna be locked in, uh, written in stone. It's not gonna be locked into. Um, there are gonna be different circumstances that impact recovery, uh, but build a service level objective. You're gonna try to get your customer back up and running in X number of hours or X number of days per device or per incident that's impacted. Um, and you can't just say per incident because you know one machine with ransomware is a lot easier to recover 
normally than say the entire organization. On uh, some of those, you've got to pay for a decryptor. On others, you're going to um, uh, go to the backup tapes. Others, you're going to recover from offsite or you're going to fail over. Lots of different scenarios. Um, you need to have those documented on how you your customer wants you to proceed, and don't build up too many service levels as well. You know, have a good, better, best, a bronze, silver, a gold, a platinum. Um, if everything is a one-off and it's custom, then nothing has priority. Um, so then there is um, the how, you know, the where, the why, you know, continue to expand out this structure. Um, from a how perspective, this one's easy. You know, inventory the products and the technologies that you're, technologies you're currently using today. Um, map them to the customers and the devices that are being protected. If you're using two solutions or three solutions, document the overlap. Um, pull out your reports, pull out all of your documentation, your configurations. Um, if something's underprotected, make a note of that. Hey, I've got three different solutions and nobody's backing up this server. Um, think about the where. Uh, where you're storing this data, you know, document, is it going to tape, is it going to local disk, is it going off-site to a, a customer data center, a colo, to a private cloud, who's got access to it, um, who's got authorization to request the media to log in, to retrieve the encryption keys. Um, while you're looking at those outside vendors and sources, think about their certifications, um, the compliance measures, uh, the encryption levels, is there redundancy, is there fault tolerance? Um, a lot of this is investigation, and maybe you knew this when you signed up with a vendor originally, but you haven't requested those reports in uh, six months or six years. Pull that information into a repository so you have it when your customer's hit by an audit. Um, finally, think about the bandwidth or the amount of time needed to retrieve this data. You can't meet a service level objective if you've got more data that can be sent across the wire uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And then the why. This is your end game. Why are you actually offering backups for your customer? And what does your customer really need? Is it for protection against ransomware or hardware failure? Uh, maybe they need access to 30 or 60 or 90 days worth of, of backups. Um, or maybe it's for industry compliance. You know, there's security requirements here or uh, industry requirements that say they need uh, long-term retention via archiving with monthly data sets retained for, you know, X number, three, five, seven, 15 years. Um, having that documented is gonna allow you to meet the service level uh, that they are, uh, or they think they are paying you for. All of this protection boils down to recovery. So if we look at my next slide here, um, the data recovery, it's a little bit like that. It's the when, the what if, the how long, and the where. Um, um, and this is about documenting how you're gonna help the customer and you're prepared to help the customer when they call in. Um, the when is about determining uh, if you're gonna be able to prep and be proactive. Selling them a solution where you've got standby virtual machines getting productive and migrating them off of old hardware onto new hardware utilizing uh, data protection tools or virtualizing that obsolete hardware into a hypervisor so they can continue to run without the potential of hardware failure. The what um, is um, uh, the fact that sometimes you've got to be reactive. Um, you know, what if this fails? What if that fails? You come in and you do your restores. What's the documented process? Have you tested it? It's a great time for you to consider setting up an extra level of testing that you can sell to your customers um, as part of a periodic testing plan. Um, and you can run your uh, employees through recovery uh, drills so they understand that um, how the solution works, when the call comes through, they've honed their skills, they know exactly what to expect. The how long, is it a day, is it hours, is it minutes? Um, the potential here is, could be the livelihood of the business. Um, there's lots of factors you need to investigate. Um, how long does it take to triage the malware, to repair or source new, resource, sorry, source new hardware? Um, there's about provisioning into the cloud or maybe transferring data across the wire. Be careful not to over-promise and under-deliver here. Uh, your customer's gonna hold you to your service level agreement, your service level objectives. Um, you wanna give yourself a little bit of wiggle room so that you can be successful. And then finally, um, um, you know, uh, close everything out with how long it's going to take to restore. You know, if your site's been impacted or the hardware's been lost or things have been damaged, um, there's going to be a delay until it's back up and running or you can get a new access to a new site, uh, new hardware shipped, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, cloud and offsite might be a, a possible uh, recovery uh, target, but you need to map that out first. You don't want to go explore Azure or AWS or any other cloud source while the customer is down, while they're waiting for you to get the system back up and online. Uh, you wanna get that, that planned out up front. Um, so that's what I have. It's a very, very detailed checklist. It's gonna give you a lot of food for thought. Um, let me turn this back over to um, uh, Mark Andre, our head uh, automation nerd, so he can talk about optimizing your existing tools.
So optimizing your tool is, is, is something that you really want to take, take time to do. And on any given day, you typically don't have time. So you work with the tools you have and you're happy and you move on. But now that you know, you can carve a little bit of time, hopefully, during this. I, I've gone through and I've put through a few things that I would recommend to do during this time. The first part is tweaking your monitoring. Monitoring is where you get all your alerts, you get everything that's happening in the environment. So obviously, the first part is look at your RMM dashboard. No matter what platform you use, look at your dashboard and see what alerts comes out. Look for things that you ignore and things that are not working properly. So surveys that are misconfigured, that are erring out incorrectly, that are not necessarily failure, but they are things that you ignore because you don't care. Look at all these things and make a list of things that you have to review. Uh, and I'll cover that in another slide, how, what I would recommend with those. Uh, you also want to look into your tickets. Um, you want to find customer tickets for outages uh, that you were not notified for. Um, so if a customer says, hey, my system is down, uh, whether it's a server, it's a service, whatever the case is, and you're getting alerted by the customer, it typically means you missed the boat on monitoring. And hopefully you can monitor it, but you know it, this would be typically something I would recommend to be careful and look at and say, can I monitor this thing? You also want to look for recurring tickets. If you get uh, tickets coming in either from the customer or alerts that are saying you know fairly often, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, well, now that you have time, look for the root cause, fix the root cause, and move on. Um, similarly, at notifications, so if notifications come from your RMM, from your third-party platform, from wherever in the world, look at notifications, and you want to find repeating things as well. So alerts that come in, you know, say, ooh, there's an issue with something, oh, it's fixed. Ooh, there's an issue with something, oh, it's fixed. And it opens and closes the ticket over and over again, or it causes the fact that you ignore them because if the issue comes in and your tech knows like, yeah, it does that all the time, it'll just go away in 20 minutes, they will never look into the ticket because they know the ticket will disappear by itself. Well, that's a problem. You want to have those reviewed and figure out what is happening. Is it the threshold is incorrect? Is it that you didn't do it properly? Whatever the case is, but you want to find what the issue is so you can fix it. Um, and again, you want to find alerts that you ignore. So if you get tickets in and your ticks just close a ticket or ignore it altogether, you want to find out why and work through those. Um, and then internal processes are not so much monitoring, but there is part of it to me. And you want to find inefficiencies. So find technician pain points, what to do, to do with monitoring, with self-healing, with auto, automation and things like that, and find things that you can make better. Uh, as you review your RMM dashboard, you want to look for things that you ignore. If you ignore it, you want to ask yourself these questions, right? Like, is it important to me? And if it is, well, should we monitor it? And if should we monitor it, then why are we ignoring it if we bother to monitor it? And then is, is there something that we can do? So as you go through all these steps, you're going to figure out, well, if it's important and you're not monitoring it or you are monitoring it but you ignore it, well, what's happening, right? Is it one of those like, oh, patch status goes failed all, all every month because we delay patches, that's normal? No, it's really not. You can totally change your thresholds, configure it however you need, and then move on so that it doesn't fail. Whenever it fails, it tells you something's wrong. You can totally deal with that. Um, you also want to look into services that don't work properly, right? You want to find out, is there is an update that caused an issue, whether an update to your RMM, an update to the, uh, the script, an update to the service itself, an update to the application, an update to the customer's environment, whatever. Is there something that is causing something to not work the way it should? And as you look through these, you're going to find out, is there a problem with the monitoring itself? Is there something that we should do? And do we even need that service? Because sometimes you'll go through all these steps and figure out, like, well, we didn't need this anymore. <laughs> and then you just wasted X amount of your life, and you could have done something else better for it. So you want to look through these things and figure out, are they things that I need? Are they important? And then make a decision. And that is something that I cannot understate. As I visit partners, one of the things that I do is um dump out tickets and information about the environment and things like that and we review these things and way too often i'll find things that are ignored that are not working the way they should and i'm told like yeah it's normal i'm like no it's really not there's totally something you can do there's absolutely always something you can do to tweak it and people because they're too busy they don't take the time Similarly to looking at your alerts you want to look at your tickets and i'm putting a ticket separately because if you want to find customer tickets about outages that you were not notified for you want to decide why am i not monitoring is it because a customer is not paying me for it is it because i haven't bothered to do it can i monitor it should i monitor it like what is the next step here 
And as you look into that, you can totally figure out what you want to do and decide from there. And there are a ton of options for you as the MSP to decide what you, oops, what you would like to do um, I would those kind of tickets and you also want to look for recurring tickets because you can decide can I be proactive about it can I monitor it or self feel it can I do automation periodically there's all kinds of things that you can do you can decide to say like you know what if this printer as an this printer on uh, this uh, server or this desktop has an issue every few days well why not do a self feel or a proactive maintenance to restart that service or to trigger some kind of task to fix it every single day to prevent it from occurring every three days. Why not do that? If you know that this server has an issue once a week, why not be proactive and do something to get it out of the way so that you never have an issue? Again, you're not fixing the root cause, you're finally you're putting a Band-Aid, but that Band-Aid will take care of it for you, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You, it is something that you can totally do. Uh, and you can, you can absolutely uh, handle it this way. Um, and then what next, right? So when you're in doubt, you want to automate. That's something that I always tell people. Um, so from everything I've covered so far, pick the item that you feel can be done better. Find things that you're not doing the best way possible, and then either build something to automate it, again, monitoring, automation, self-healing, you name it, you pick it, whatever. You want to review the cookbook. You want to find things that you can do through the platform that already exists because we bother to spend so many hours every week to create stuff for you guys, and all you have to do is copy, paste, and use it. Why not do so? And the cookbook is where all that stuff is, and hopefully somebody will put that in the, in the chat for me while I'm talking. Um, and finally, if you don't know what to do, if you want advice, just email me. I get emails from partners day in, day out, every day saying, hey, I'm trying to do X. What do you recommend? And the recommendation might be like, hey, well, something's obviously wrong. Uh, open a support case, the uh, issue might be so-and-so, here's a monitoring, or you know what, that's a new one, let's build it together, whatever the case is. And you see, uh, someone's asking for my email, it's on the screen there, again, if somebody can, yeah, I'm, somebody's putting it on the, ch in the chat for me, thank you, Eric. So, uh, well, one of the Eric's. Uh, thank you for that. So again, reach out to me, ask for help. One of the things that people don't do enough is ask for help. If you're hitting a wall and we're like, I don't know what to do next, ask us. This is how we help you guys become better at it. This is how we create advocates to work with us and help us and make the product better. And also a lot of partners share what they create with us as we work with them. And that makes the whole ecosystem better. So this is good for everyone. This is not a me thing. This is not a you thing. This is an everyone thing. And I can totally help with everybody everywhere. And then finally, you want to look through your integrations. Your integration is something that you often overlook because you configure the integration one and you move on. And uh, for example, a lot of people I've, I've visited, I've set up their PSA integration with their RMM and they did it once and it worked and they moved on. And then they came back and they said like, oh, it's too noisy, turn it off, tweak this, remove whatever, and they just left it alone. And what ends up happening is that you can use, uh, you know, different mechanism to do open, update, close ticket automatically, auto update, reopen tickets, things like that. And you can automate that through the platform and you can do it much better than you likely do today in a lot of cases. So taking the time to review this will help you. You can classify tickets as precisely as you can through your PSA. One thing that I way too often see is that people will do tickets for printer issues. And as they do, um, they will uh, they will see tickets for, uh, I don't know, something to do with, um, I don't know, anything to do with printer. Let's use that as an example, printer issues. Well, it could be, you know, a printer is broken, you need a part, you need toner, really. You need a, a driver update, there's a broken PC, there's a variety of different issues, user error, really, too. But people only put printers. Well, at the end of the month, when you want to know how much time did I waste on physical printer problems that I may or may not be covering, well, you wouldn't know because you see printer issues. So you want to take the time to make your classification proper and as detailed as you can. I'm not saying make 4,000 categories, not what I'm saying, but you want to take the time to do it properly and go in depth. Again, use your RMM to reopen the same ticket when there's an issue. One thing that I often see people do is they'll spend time on the same ticket over and over again, but because it makes new tickets every few days, they don't realize it's the same issue because it goes to different tags because it's busy and whatever. And they just keep working through the issue and resolving it every time, but it always comes back. And they've invested hours and hours and hours of time that they could have done better by using the platform. So absolutely take the time to review that if you can. Um, and then you want to review your tools to the PSA integrations. We recommend to funnel everything through your RMM platform, whatever you use, 
to to redo the duplication and uh, have as few sources of tickets and one version for all the monitoring. But if you can't ensure that whatever you use to integrate with your PSA, if you do email ticket or whatever, that you categorize and classify and prioritize them properly. A lot of people will get a ton of noise from their AV platforms or their backup platform or whatever into their PSA, and then they get overwhelmed and they ignore it, and that doesn't work for anybody. So you really want to take the time to do this uh, properly. As we move on, I'm going to move on to our next nerd for the next section. Thanks, Mark. Um, so um, I was asked, obviously, to um, uh, look at optimizing tools above and beyond the Solar Winds tools that are available in the organization. Um, so sometimes uh, you may want to add additional tools to supplement your current offering. You want to expand. Maybe you want to change. I'm not encouraging you to uh, rip out or replace anything, but occasionally there are new needs that you need to go after. Um, so with that guidance, I thought I would do it based on a little bit of do's and don'ts and give you that checklist to help prevent some of those headaches and maybe some buyer's remorse uh, in the future after you've implemented or rolled out a new tool. Um, so from starting with a list of dues, um, you know, you're going to want to look for tools from established vendors, vendors you already have relationships with. Uh, sometimes it's easier to just turn on an additional feature, a checkbox, something that's already built in or integrated, uh, something you didn't know they had. Turn that on easily and quickly without having to go through a, a significant lead cycle, purchase cycle, evaluation cycle. Um, however, um, that's not always the case. So if you are going to go outside of established vendors, uh, think about uh, environments where the vendor has an existing reputation. Um, Gartner, for instance, uh, publishes a magic quadrant on various industries, um, and you can look here to see if a uh, organization is established in a given market. Uh, are they a leader? Are they growing very fastly? What's the completeness of their vision? Um, and they're going to have this available for uh, tons of different industries, tons of different solutions. Um, it's a great way to get um, a good understanding of where somebody is at. Are they really overhyped? Are they underhyped? Are they undervalued? Are they growing very quickly? And there's several other other uh, things to think about here. Maybe it's, uh, is the tool going to increase your efficiency or your productivity? Well, that's obviously a do. Is it going to fill a feature gap or expand your services, something else you can charge uh, your customers for or uh, show value against your competition? Obviously a great thing to do. But also think about compatibility with existing vendors. Um, are there established user groups and customer reviews out there where you can get um, the true word of how this works from actual users, you know, not um, uh, quotes on the website and not um, uh, user boards that could be uh, filled full of shills for the organization. Um, Finally, think about security consciousness. Um, so um, do they have a good established patch and update and release cycle? Um, do they have multi-factor authentication? Uh, those kind of things. Um, obviously, you don't want to adopt something new that's going to open up a big security hole inside of uh, your organization. So those are some of the do's, but there's also some considerations you might think about here that maybe I'm kind of on the fence of a little bit and um, you know uh, un unsure of or undecided. So um, when you think about subscription versus perpetual licensing, consider those. You know, don't rule those out immediately just because it's one or the other model. There's lots of good tools available in multiple models. Um, pick one that's going to work for you, uh, but don't rule out the others until you've uh, uh, looked at the other factors. Uh, the other things are open source and connecti and community driven applications. Um, don't rule those out. You know, there's some really great open source tools. Uh, you just want to make sure that they've got a good backing from a company that's going to continue to support them or the community is going to adopt it and pick it up and keep it running forward. The last thing you want to do is get an adoption going and then realize that, hey, there's no support for this. Uh, nobody's expanding it. It's obsolete now that a new version of an operating system has come out. Um, so those are considerations around the do's. Uh, let's talk about the don'ts. Uh, the don'ts are what you want to avoid, hopefully. Um, so, you know, don't sign up for uh, a company that's not going to offer you a free evaluation. Don't pay to trial the software. Um, make sure that you're not picking products that have significant feature overlap. If you've already bought the technology and you're not looking to rip and replace, why would you buy that technology again? Um, Look for overhyped products. Um, Gartner also offers a very similar uh, hype cycle. So you can see here's an example of artificial intelligence. And there's really only two markets in artificial intelligence that have taken off that have uh, gone past that original original uh, hype cycle. And that one is uh, voice recognition. Um, um, and you're going to see that on your smart devices. Uh, you're going to see that, you know, in your Alexas and your Googles and your iPhones and those. And the other is going to be um, you want to look for the uh, the various cycles. Uh, make sure that you're not buying into something that just isn't market ready. Um, 
look at hidden costs, uh, look at cases where they're going to require you to have a certified technician on staff. All those are very easy red flags to think, maybe I don't want to go down the path with, with this tool. Let's look at something else. Um, I have considerations here, though, also. And while these are not necessarily red flags, um, they could help you relate to vendors that are going to be uh, more profitable. You know, a free tool or a low-cost tool, while that's great, um, if the company doesn't become profitable at some point, the product could go end of life, uh, they could halt updates, or they could jack up your price after you've adopted and deployed. So keep that in mind. Um, finally, look at a vendor uh, as to where they're based. Uh, what's their likelihood of acquisition by a competitor or another part of the uh, another part of the industry? If they're going to get acquired and promoted, that's great but the prices could increase. If they're going to get acquired and uh, shut down, well, you've lost that tool. Um, all of these go into your consideration. Hopefully, this is nothing new for you, but it's a good checklist which you can run through very quickly and say yes, 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 no, and start to rule out some of those edge cases. Um, let me turn it back over now to our head operations nerd, Eric Anthony. He's going to cover motivating, motivating and engaging those employees that he talked about earlier. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we can do with our employees during this work from home period. Um, and specifically, we'll want to talk about motivating and engaging them. So on the motivating subject, um, we want to make sure that everybody's staying on a schedule, uh, making sure that they're taking breaks, taking lunches, and that they're starting and stopping at the times they should be. The reason why is we want to make sure that, especially during this time, that they have the opportunity to handle the personal things in addition to the work things that they need to, and that everybody is uh, taking care of themselves in addition to taking care of their responsibilities at work. Uh, some things you can do to help motivate them, have some virtual team get-togethers that are outside of work. And obviously you can't meet up in person, so you have to meet up virtually still, but you know, give them a chance to talk about things that are not necessarily related to work, that are you know, more around frustrations in general, things like that just so they have a chance to interact in that way like they normally would in the office. Uh, find ways to gamify everyday tasks. We talked about some pretty boring stuff in the beginning in terms of documentation and processes. Make those fun, uh, especially when it comes to going through and checking asset information and contact information in your PSA. You know, Set some goals and, and give some rewards out for, for reaching those goals, things like that. Anything you can do to make it more engaging and make it more fun. Also, there are things you can do to help limit their distractions at home. Uh, you know, working from home, unless you have a really good setup in a separate room, can be very difficult and can be very distracting. There are a lot of people working from their kitchen counters these days, and maybe just a new headset or a chair or a desk can make a huge amount of difference to where and how they get to work at home. So, you know, consider those things uh, if you have the means to do so. Now, when it comes to motivating employees, I did a little research and Harvard Business Review kind of had a great article on this and broke it down to three negative and three positive motivators. So the three negative motivators start with emotional pressure. Right now, there's a huge amount of emotional pressure because of the situation that we're in. Make sure that when you are engaging employees, you're managing employees, that you're making sure that you don't force them to choose between personal and work priorities. Now, obviously they need to get their work done, that's what you're paying them to do, but you can create a severe emotional conflict if you are forcing them to choose between personal and work priorities. So just keep that in mind, and make sure you're probing them to make sure uh, that they're keeping that right personal and work balance. Uh, economic pressure, even though your employees may still be employed full-time, they may have uh, other family members, partners, uh, even children in the household uh, that are losing their jobs. And so that's creating economic pressure on the family unit uh, or on that household. So keep that in mind as well. And then a little bit of a strange one, and this one can happen at any time. It doesn't have to have a special circumstance like this, but it's called inertia. And it occurs when an employee no longer understands or identifies 
why they can want to continue working and doing what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. They're just going through the motions, doing it by rote. They're not engaged. They're not motivated. And they're simply going through the motions because it's what they did yesterday. Now, on the other side of this, we have three positive motivators that can cancel out the other ones in a very positive way. First of all, play. Uh, Anytime you can add gamification, experimentation, building things, uh, especially for technicians. Technicians love gamification. They love experimenting with new things, setting up new test environments, uh, building new solutions. Those are all things that, especially right now, when they have a little bit of downtime, let them build that test environment uh, that they've been putting off. They will have fun doing that and it will make them engaged. Make sure that they have purpose. Make sure that you as their manager or business owner are tying their work to business and customer outcomes because that will give them a feeling of accomplishment that gives them a, a personal purpose and a personal worth uh, to the work that they're doing for the business. And then of course, give them potential. They are doing this job obviously as a benefit to them and a benefit to you. Their benefit is income, but their benefit also comes from things like training and learning. That's because in their life overall, in their career, they need to grow that personal potential wherever they're at so that they add personal value so that they can move up in their career. And so those opportunities, those abilities to gain potential are important for you as an employer to provide. Uh, studies show that a lot of times that employees will stick around if you train them well and let them grow and give them space and opportunities to grow with the business rather than have to grow out of the business. All right, so let's turn from motivation to productivity. Now we talked about work schedule and calendars a little bit already, but one of the things we wanna do is from a tactical standpoint is making sure, and I do this personally, is track their work against a calendar. So every day I go through and for that day, if I have any empty space in my calendar, the first thing I do is fill it up with the tasks that I want to accomplish that day. I color code them. So in blue, I might use work stuff for personal stuff. I might use green or for other projects that kind of don't follow into both. Both I might use purple, um, as you can see in the example there in the picture. Uh, you want to make sure that they're using their time wisely and they're tracking it so that they know that they're using their time wisely. You also want to keep everyone in sync. You want to make sure that when somebody goes to lunch, everybody else knows. Uh, when they're you know, starting at seven and working until four, everybody knows that schedule so that you can create an overlap to make sure that your help desk is covered. And that brings us also to uh, their, their overall schedule. And you as a manager needs to make sure that you're flexible, but also still holding them accountable. Um, they need to work their standard eight hours a day or whatever their shift is. You need to maintain that help desk coverage. So you need to make sure that everybody understands they still need to you know, start working at this time and end working at this time to make sure that help desk is covered. You need to be tracking tasks and projects to make sure that they keep on schedule. You need to Take a look at your ticket volumes. Make sure that your ticket volumes are at appropriate levels, even if they're up or down for this time. You should know percentage-wise across the board where everybody kind of falls and just kind of make sure those look like they're in alignment. And speaking of the ticketing system, make sure that it's up to date, neat and tidy. Take your spare time and make sure you're cleaning up the data and you're cleaning out old tickets so that they're not taking up valuable time with you know, your technicians having to look at them or go past them every time they look at them. And that brings us to communication. Uh, first of all, you wanna maintain all the meetings you were having before, especially one-on-ones. And I know we've talked about that in the past, but it is important. It is important to do video calls. So you do wanna make sure that everybody can see each other. Now, I did hear something very important the other day. There have been some studies, because obviously, you know, this is the kind of the new normal for right now. And some people, especially when you have large video calls, they have trouble engaging because they're so focused on the video that's happening on the screen uh, that they don't engage. So if somebody's having trouble engaging in a meeting or engaging in meetings in general, uh, kind of suggest that they turn off their video for a while 
and try and engage without the video on. Uh, they have found that that does help. And then I've talked about holding daily stand-up meetings before, but I haven't really provided any context to it or any detail. And so this is what, uh, you know, quite frequently they will look at. Uh, first of all, it's a daily realignment so that everybody on the team stays focused. That's the most important uh, point of the stand-up meetings. And a couple of things to include, uh, issues from the previous day so that everybody learns what happened and how it was resolved so that everybody can take that forward and solve the same problems again next time using this information. Also include any potential challenges that you see on the schedule for that day because somebody else may have a great idea as to how to solve that problem and then that person, whoever's in charge of that ticket, can go ahead and take that information and hopefully solve that ticket or that problem faster. Make them as short as possible, 30 minutes maximum, hopefully is what you can keep them to. And one of the ways to do that is to create and distribute an agenda at least an hour beforehand so that all of your technicians can be prepared and know what the topics are that are gonna come up so that you can get through them quicker and they've already thought about them before they come into the meeting. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Gil so he can talk about new skills among your technicians. Great, thanks. That ties in a lot with what you were just talking about, Eric, right? I, you know, making sure that people are engaged and feel like they're being involved. Um, you know, developing new skills is absolutely something that you can focus on during this time. Um, now, that means that, you know, when you're talking to your technicians and your employees, you should encourage new skill development because technologies are changing rapidly and, and you should make sure that the skill sets that, that your technicians have uh, complement a lot of these changes or growth in technology. So some things you might want to do is allot some time in, in your technician schedules to, uh, to help encourage them to take some certifications, additional training. Um, this is going to improve marketability for your entire um, MSP. Um, you know, that, once you can show that, that you do have knowledgeable technicians, uh, that definitely helps improve that close for new prospects as well. Um, but it also does increase that confidence level, that feeling of engagement, as well as the efficiency of the teams uh, that, that you are working with. So focus on building a progression, show them that there is a, a path. You know, we talked about uh, becoming a, a subject matter expert in security. Uh, this is a great way to show someone who has that interest how they can grow into that role. Um, now, I'm not going to review all of these, but uh, you can assign a goal to complete X amount of certs during this time. You, know, you give a three-month time frame, it would be at Microsoft Technologies, uh, someone who's entry level who wants to improve their knowledge set, or someone who wants to add something like programming or basic programming so that they can do more automation and scripting. Um, some vendor um, certifications as well, uh, Microsoft, uh, Cisco, VMware, and if you're moving into cloud, some of the cloud certifications would be really good. Um, and let's not forget about, uh, you know, we have trainings here on the MSP Institute. Um, the Head Nerds Boot Camps and Office Hours are great ways for them to uh, improve their skills. Um, and then if someone is growing into that security subject matter expert, focusing on things like CompTIA Security Plus, CISSP, or even something like CCNA CyberOps, are great ways for you to uh, have your technicians improve their skill set. We're gonna pass it over now to Eris, and hopefully you still have uh, salespeople making sales and they definitely need to improve their skills. So Eris, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kill. First off, guys, I know we're at the top of the hour here, so I will try to take this home as fast as I can if you guys will bear with me here. Now, hopefully everyone in the audience is still selling, uh, perhaps to different verticals or maybe up market for the first time, but likely you still have a little extra time. So getting some of this sales training done is a great idea, right? After all, the number one reason why a company goes bankrupt is not a lack of communication or a lack of uh, product or service. It is, in fact, a lack of sales. All salespeople, regardless of the years of experience, need to continually work on their craft. Sales, more than most disciplines, changes regularly. So you need to stay on top of what's happening. If you think IT support changes rapidly, try selling it, right? As, as such, sales training really should be a regular and routine exercise if you're going to be a top MSP. So if you haven't done it regularly before, now's the time to start that routine, okay? To start with, we have some sales training in the Institute for you. We cover topics like value proposition, sales process, and objection handling, to name a few. 
this will be an area we focus on as we work to create even more content this year. But no matter how much content we create for you, there's always more you can do. This is a very popular topic with lots of resources available for you to tap into, like online webinars and podcasts and books. There are so many books. Take advantage of all of these types of resources. If you add even just one thing to your sales acumen from each of those sources, you will become a much better salesperson in the end. Also, you should look, uh, you should be taking the time to role play with your employees. Like one of you, the customer, the other, the salesperson. Chances are it's been a while since you've heard what your people are saying if you're a bit larger. And if you're smaller and you hear it all the time, then even then I suggest focusing on probably the most important part of the conversation in the sales process, and that's the ROI conversation. Return on investment is the key to winning more deals and avoiding that pricing objection at the end of it all. Which leads me to, to the final point on this slide. Now is the time to re-examine your sales process. Find the points of friction and remove them. Identify if there's a piece of collateral or, or some tool you can implement, implement to make things uh, you know, more clear to the prospect, for example. I had one customer once upon a time who created a, a full business analysis questionnaire for himself. Um, he did it because he wasn't really a sales guy and he wanted to make sure he didn't you know, forget any of the important questions. And, and that helped him not only create consistency, but somehow it also instilled confidence to the prospect as well, as it was obvious to them anyways, that this was a professional who had done this sort of thing before. So make sure you're collecting the right information so that when it's time to have that ROI conversation, um, you have all the ammunition you need to convince the customer that it's in their best interest to do business with you, okay? Now is a great time to ensure you have all the right elements for your sales process in place. Now, that leads me perfectly uh, to the next step check, because similarly, you should also focus on your financial processes. No department should be more process-driven than finance. There are three areas I'd suggest looking at, starting with your invoicing, okay? You've just performed a bunch of mini projects to help your customers work from home. Did you charge for it? Are you deferring it? Have you decided to waive it? Regardless of the answer, you should show this type of thing on your invoice. Even if you did it for free, you should show that $0 line item, right? Customers tend to forget the nice things you do for them, uh, you know, if you don't remind them, right? Like, like five-minute calls you take in your car that never make it to the invoice, for example. Now is the time to figure out how best to include these types of items in how you want to handle them moving forward because they always forget the great stuff you've done and focus on the negative. So putting them on the invoice serves as a short-term reminder when needed um, and also as a historical reminder you know, of the extra value you bring to the table if you need to refer to it down the road. Okay, Then take that step further and look in the mirror a bit as well. Are you notoriously bad at getting your invoices out on time? I'm sure some of you are nodding right now. Are your customers aware of their payment options? This is your chance to catch up to your billing cycles and stay ahead of them moving forward so that you at least remove yourself from one of the possible reasons they haven't paid you on time, okay? Get yourself, get, to, get those things out the door right and have the first of every month not the second not the fifth and include a quick conversation about your payment options into your next cio vcio or or you know quarterly business review meeting right start the conversation with a general question about your invoices something like you know what uh, do you think I, about them or or how do i make do they make sense or how can i make them uh, you know more clear for you right these types of questions will naturally lead uh, to this topic in a soft way, plus you'll get some valuable insight into how your customers are seeing your billing process. Then implement those changes now that you have the time. And then speaking of process, have you made it efficient as it can be? The best MSPs I've worked with have integrated their RMMs into their PSAs and their PSAs into their accounting package. That way, they have automated much of their ticket to billing workflow. And instead of spending time creating those invoices, they're spending time auditing them instead. On the, uh, on the contract side, are you supporting more devices now than you were before? Have you added them to your contract? Have you outlined how much or how little you are servicing those new work from home devices, for example? Even if it doesn't change your price, you should have updated your language temporarily and drawn the line in the sand that describes what you are and aren't doing for these new devices. 
Are you including these devices but not touching the PCs back at the office? Do you need to do both? Is your SLA the same even though nobody is at the office? These questions and the way you deal with this now has an impact on how you should look at your contracts long term. Now is a great time to reinvent and update those contracts and the language within them, depending on how long it's been since you've looked at that, of course. Are your terms and conditions still relevant? Do you have a standard contract with an appendix that outlines differences so that you don't have to edit an entire template each time? This is your chance to work on that and get it streamlined. Many of you were offering services during this period you weren't providing as part of your offerings before. Not only should you update your contract language for that, similar to the added devices we just mentioned, but it is quite possible that you may have started offering regular services, perhaps around security, for example, that you didn't offer before that have not found their way into your contracts yet. This is your chance to dot your I's and cross your T's as it relates to your contracts, okay? Make sure your contracts are updated regularly and truly reflect the services you provide provide is because that's one of the most important things you can do. You don't notice it as much because most of the time things are fine between you and your customers, but when things go wrong, you'll wish you took the time to do this for sure. Okay, and finally, work on your collections process for the future. Okay, from an accounts receivable perspective, have you collected your rollings? Who does this work for you? Is there a set process? Uh, how much time without a payment before you contact that customer? How long before you send them to collections and fire them as a customer altogether? Do you have an incentive for them to pay early? Some small discount can be enough to motivate people to act when you want them to, right? Maybe your answer will be to try and collect more upfront. Maybe that means you'll set up a credit card authorization form online if you don't have one already. One thing's for sure, this situation has made it painfully obvious that we can always be better in this department, okay? On the flip side, this situation has forced many of us to define what deferring payments or discounting should look like, not only now, but ongoing as well. But before you can make some of those decisions and definitions, do you have a clear understanding of exactly how much you're making on a per customer basis? Sure, you know what your margin's supposed to be when you price it out, but when was the last time you analyzed exactly how much time and effort you're spending on a customer by customer basis? Are there any trends by vertical or geography that you should be aware of that may end up changing your future direction? This is the time to do the research on all of those things. Maybe you'll start doing credit checks before taking on new customers or start selling into different verticals that you believe are more recession proof, right? Maybe you'll identify some markers that all slow paying customers have in common that you can use to make better customer decisions with in the future. The only way to change for the better is to take the time that's given to you and self reflect on all aspects of your business. This is the way we have to work moving forward forward. We have, we have tried to put as many of those angles of attack into this presentation as possible today, right? But obviously there's more. This is your chance to come out stronger and more efficient if you use your time wisely. So with that, I want to say thank you again for everybody that's joined us on the Nerds uh, to, to perform and, and provide this, this uh, presentation. I want to thank everybody in the audience uh, for showing up and staying with us. Please, everyone, stay happy, happy healthy, and safe. As, every, as we move forward through this together as a global community. Have a great day, everyone.